Good morning and welcome everyone. We are so, so, so excited for today's conversation. Um, you know, there are over 700 registrants for today's session because I think everybody is so excited about coming together for this important conversation um, today. So thank you so much for being here and for being here now. Um, we are recording this, so uh, just so that everyone knows. And 
what I wanted to start by saying is welcome, of course, but also that, you know, what we care for, what we care about, what we take care of becomes our legacy. It can define us, it can fuel us, it can feed us, and most importantly, it can teach us. And we learn in all different kinds of ways, especially when we are moved, when we feel something, when we have that need to take action and to do something. I See Stars welcomes all the partners for this magnificent event, all the organizations that are doing something that are caring and making a difference in the world. So we thank you, uh, the Jane Goodall Institute, the Forest Preserves of Cook County, the Lincoln Park Zoo, the Brookfield Zoo. And of course, my name is Sandy Castrell and I represent I See Stars. Um, I See Stars, for those of you who don't know, we're a technology training organization that also develops the next generation of leaders. And so what sits between technology and leadership is this understanding of systems thinking and how do we change systems to make a better world for all of us. So today we are kids, we are grown-ups, and we are everyone in between planting seeds for the future and cultivating and caring for what is possible, what is change, and what is the future. It is my proud honor to introduce Juanita Garcia, and she's a senior project manager of high performance and sustainable construction at Pepper Construction Company here in Chicago. And drawing on more than 10 years of experience in mechanical design, Juanita is an environmentalist for the built environment and an advocate for diversity in STEM careers. In 2009, she was one of the first people to earn the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED accreditation professional credential with a specialization in building design and construction. Juanita founded BIM for better and, uh, I'm sorry, Juanita founded BIM for better and hosts Shades of Green Chicago, a podcast highlighting the stories of environmentalists of color. Her work has been informed by her study of psychology, human rights, and massage therapy, which allows her to incorporate a well-rounded health <clears throat> and wellness perspective into the built environment. Juanita's contributions to the Chicago sustainability community include serving as chairperson of the board of directors of Waste Shed, a nonprofit that diverts materials from landfills for creative reuse. And she is also on the advisory council of environmentalists of color. And lastly, I'm proud to say that she is an alumnus of IC Stars from Cycle 26. Thank you so much, Juanita. Hooray! Oh, thank you, Sandy. You, of course. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm, I'm excited to get to introduce uh, um, Jane and Creed. So uh, I'll start with uh, the great honor of introducing um, well -renowned, world renowned ethologist and conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall. Uh, over 60 years ago, Jane Goodall first set foot on the shores of what is today Tanzania's Gombe National Park to begin her pioneering chimpanzee behavioral study. In this last six decades, this research has transformed scientific perceptions on the relationship between humans and animals, and with her mission evolving into a quest to empower others to make the world a better place for all living things. In 1977, uh, Dr. Goodall established the Jane Goodall Institute, a global leader in innovative conservation approaches that better the lives of local people living around chimpanzee habitats. Today, the Institute operates with 30 global offices supporting the research in Gambi, in addition to innovative community-centered conservation projects, chimpanzee sanctuaries in Africa, and the Institute's international youth program, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, celebrating the 30th anniversary this year. I also have the honor to introduce Cree, uh, Cradell Walls. Um, throughout his career, he's dedicated uh, been dedicated to engaging the next generation of conservation advocates in outdoors to connect to nature. He's managed youth programs uh, with the Garfield Park Conservatory Alliance 
and was the Illinois State Coordinator for Roots and Shoots. Uh, he has a BA from DePaul, uh, an MA in biology from Miami University. He's a graduate of the 2019 Latino Policy Forum and Multicultural Leadership Academy, which promotes black and brown unity. He's a 97 alum of AmeriCorps for Chicago Allies Program and, uh, and is a proud alum of public housing and Chicago public school systems. Um, Cordell is currently the outreach program coordinator for the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Um, and I think with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I think we'll dive in to get to hear more from Jane and Cree about their own experiences. I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick off with asking Jane, um, you know, I'd like to start with how the opportunity to, to, uh, to go to Tanzania to study chimpanzees and what got you started there. Well, I suppose it started when I was a very small child growing up in this very house where I've been during the pandemic, born loving animals, having a very supportive mother. And when I was 10 years old, I had saved up my few pennies pocket money. It was during World War II. And I found this little secondhand book, Tarzan of the Apes. Well, I read that and of course, fell passionately in love with this glorious Lord of the Jungle who went and married the wrong Jane, I thought. <laughs> and so uh, that started my dream. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. Everybody laughed at me. How will you do that? <laughs> Far away place, don't have money, and you're just a girl. So my mother wasn't like that. She just said, if you really want to do this thing, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of all opportunities. If you don't give up, you may find a way. So anyway, I saved up money. I answered a, a um, invitation from a school friend to go to Kenya. There I met the late Louis Leakey, famous paleontologist. And I think he was impressed by how much I knew about African animals, even though I'd only just arrived from England. I'd never been to college because we couldn't afford it. But anyhow, he gave me this amazing opportunity to go and study not just any animal, but the closest to us, the, the chimpanzee. All right, and Kriya, you've blazed a different but parallel path towards working in the environment. Can you share a bit about your story and how that passion got started within you? Oh, Cree, you're muted. Sorry. I realized. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I, I do come from a very humble upbringing, um, a family of eight. Um, we didn't have much growing up. I did live in public housing, and there was a, por a portion of the public housing that I lived in. We didn't have a lot of nature in the portion that I lived in. And so it wasn't until my teenage years when I got connected to a bunch of people who was outside of my housing complex putting together a community garden. And I didn't, have, I didn't have an idea of what the plants were over there at the time. I know that they were basils, tomatoes, and cucumbers now. But at the time, I just saw a lot of people over there planting in the garden, enjoying themselves, having fun. And, and I needed something to do, and I wanted something to do that felt safe and comfortable versus what I was uh, used to growing up. And so working with the group of people out there putting together that community garden and also being in charge of supervising younger kids, which I did not enjoy doing at the time, <laughs> uh, that kind of opened my eyes up to being more connected to the outdoors and to nature. And, and, it, and it probably wasn't until even later on in my life when I started working at Garfield Park Conservatory is when I developed a strong passion for working with young people uh, because I realized that it felt like they had a connection to me, which was something I wasn't used to having with anyone. But because these young people wanted to learn from me and talk to me, I decided to accept the fact that this was probably something that I was meant to do was to work with young people and to connect them to nature because I was just learning how to love the outdoors and love nature. 
So that was more, that was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, um, yeah, I guess along that path, um, you know, Cree, you've talked a little bit about mentorship and, or about the experience of, of meeting um, these students and, and making a connection with them. Uh, you know, the, the students at Roots and Shoots and the, the children you've, you've worked with, and they prove that you can be intellectually curious at any age, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to the natural world and how it um, shaped you as a person? Um, now today, I spend the bulk of my life working in the outdoors, continuing to connect young people. And prior to me having that strong connection to the to the outdoors, I wasn't a happy kid growing up. <laughs> um, I was I was shy, but I wasn't happy. And one of the biggest things I learned about myself when I'm in the outdoors is that it definitely brings a smile to my face, especially when I'm learning more about the benefits of plants, the benefits they have, not just with animals, but with people when we're out in nature, how it how it helps with our stress, how the environment just helps to feed us. Um, that connection I have right now to nature is, is not just changing my life, but it's changing the lives of people around me, especially the young people that I work with. So right now I, I have a youth outdoor ambassador program with the Forest Reserve of Cook County. And a lot of the young people, they have a background in the environment from as a child. And then there are others that this is their first time having a connection to nature. And so I am happy and blessed to be put in that position to, to be able to expose them to the outdoors. And that was the same thing when I worked with the Jane Goodall Roots and Shoes program. The youth leaders, working with those youth leaders definitely changed my life and put me in a position to uh, being here with the Forest Preserve of Cook County. Because those youth, the youth that went through that program, all types of background, amazing young people, have the same type of challenges as we all do, but they also have the same type of successes and curiosity that we all have. And I, I, yeah, and I would love, well, I'm not gonna toss out questions, but I would love to hear more about Roots and Shoots, what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, <now. laughs> Jane, I, yeah, Jane, I'd love to hear um, if you could talk a little bit about what, how Roots and Shoots started and, and talk a little bit about what they do now. Okay, of course, with pleasure. Um, it began in Tanzania in 1991 with 12 high school students from eight schools. They were concerned about things going on around them. Some worried about the poaching in the national parks. Why wasn't the government doing anything? Some worried about illegal dynamite fishing that was causing destruction of the coral reefs. Some of them were worried about street children with no homes. Some of them worried about the bad treatment of stray dogs and animals in the market. So it was a whole spectrum and they wanted my advice. So I said, well, go and, go and find your friends who are interested in this sort of thing. And we had a meeting and that's when Roots and Shoots was born because it's, its main message is every single individual makes an impact on the planet every single day and we get to choose what sort of impact we make and from the beginning because everything is interrelated we decided and it was you know some of this was me some of it was the young people it was a mixture um, that each group and um, roots and shoots would be mainly done from school groups uh, each group would choose for itself, they choose uh, projects to make the world better for people, for animals, for the environment. And I think because they get to choose, it means they start working passionately because it's something they care about and something they've mm -hmm. thought of themselves. So today, uh, Roots and Shoots is in uh, around 60 countries and We've got members, well, some preschool, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of kindergarten, very strong in university and everything in between. And these young people are changing the world. As you said, Cree, they literally are changing the world. And as we speak now, in some parts of the world, there will be 
young people out there planting trees, clearing litter, uh, writing letters to legislators, you name it, they're doing it. Yeah. And, um, you know, Jane, I, I, I also wanted to ask you too about, um, you talked about an early passion for um, an understanding and, and early really being interested in, in animals and um, in the role your mother played in fostering that. Can you talk a little bit about how allies and mentors have played a role in, in your career? Well, I mean, I had my mother and when I was at school, I didn't like school and I, uh, I didn't get on well with school. I did well academically, but um, I, I preferred to be out in nature. And where I live, we have a nice big garden and I wanted to spend time up trees and going with my dog out on the surrounding cliffs. We're just, just by the ocean here. And so uh, my, who were my mentors? Well, my mother and the rest of the family were amazing people. And then of course, when I met Dr. Leakey, he was another one, but as there was no television, didn't really meet many people. So our world was a little prescribed. And also, of course, it was war. Mm -hmm. So I was very inspired by Winston Churchill because, but for him, no question, the Germans would have invaded UK. They, they, they'd already oh, swamped the rest of Europe. And for a long time, England stood alone and we were saved by other amazing people, these young pilots who went out and most of them just got shot down. And Churchill made his famous remark, never in the history of mankind have so many cause to be grateful to so few. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Cree, can you, can you talk a little bit too about the role of allies and mentors in your career and, and where you've gone and, and the role even in mentorship too in your your life as a mentor? Yeah, as far as um, allies and mentors that played a role in my development, I would like to say that there's many because I, you know, growing up, I chose the path of learning from different people. And I used to write raps when I was younger. And there was a line in my rap that I love remembering about um, taking toes from everyone's foot just to build a footstep to create a path to where I want to go. And so, you know, with, with that being said, you know, my mom, my father, may he rest in peace, you know, they've played a huge role in my background. Uh, uh, stories about uh, Dr. Jane, your perseverance <laughs> for all the stuff that you've done stands out to me. Um, Sonny Fisher, who used to be the executive director of Richard Rehouse Foundation has been a really strong mentor for me. Uh, Jane Ann Dubin has been really great. Um, and there's a whole slew of people uh, that I just, I, I really can't name just because I take bits and bits of things that they've done or accomplished and I learn from that. And as far as mentoring young people, you know what, I've never, it has always been a challenge for me to label myself a mentor. It's always been their job to, to label me that. Um, you know, my heart has just always been with, you know, giving young people what they need to get to the next step. That's it. I listen to them. I, you know, I support them as much as I can. And, um, and you know, and just try to be a guide or a friend or someone who, who can be there for them. So, um, but I do, I do have some mentees that I work with that, you know, I check in on and they might check in on me every once in a while. Okay. But it's, it is important to have at least someone in your life that could help keep you grounded and, and be a part of your support system. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree with that. Um, so, so Jane, I, I did uh, want to want to um, ask you too about, you know, you've made these observations about chimpanzees um, using tools just that change the way we think about, about animals, the way we think about ourselves in the world. Um, but I'm curious to hear um, about um, what you think are some shared values that we have um, with chimpanzees and, and how they 
view leadership and if there are some lessons that we could learn from, from chimpanzees? Well, the first thing that struck me, once the chimpanzees stopped running away from me, which <laughs> lasted four whole months, because they are very conservative and they didn't like the sight of this strange upright white ape who suddenly appeared. But eventually, thanks to David Greybeard, who's uh, up here, over here, uh, he began to lose his fear of me. And gradually I got to know the other individuals in the community. And then it was clear, they were all very, very different personalities. And uh, we've learned over the years, there's good and bad mothers in chimp society as in human society. When it comes to nonverbal communication, it's the same, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, swaggering, shaking the fist. Um, and of course, they use tools, many different tools uh, for different purposes. And we now know that chimps across different parts of Africa, because when I began, it was just me, but now there are other field study sites. And it's very clear they have their own primitive cultures. That's behavior passed from one generation to the next through observational learning. And unfortunately, they have a dark and violent side just as we do. And they kill and they have a sort of primitive war sometimes. And it's over territory. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And, but they also have a loving, compassionate and truly altruistic side as well. So it's very clear that there isn't really a sharp line dividing us from them. And once that's admitted, then there's all the other animals. There's no barriers. We're part of and not separate from the amazing animal kingdom. But you know, back in the early 60s, when Leakey made me go to Cambridge, and he said, you haven't got time to do an undergraduate degree. He got me a place to do uh, a degree PhD in ethology. I don't know what ethology was. I've never been to college, but anyway, animal behavior. So I was nervous. And when I got there, I was told by some of the professors I'd done everything wrong, everything. I should have numbered the chimps, not named them. I couldn't talk about them having a personality, a mind capable of problem solving, and certainly not emotions similar to ours of happiness, sadness, fear, despair, anger, and so on. Well, fortunately, I had a wonderful teacher when I was a child, who I should say that he was one of my, <laughs> one of the individuals that I really, really feel a great debt of gratitude for. And there he is, my dog, Rusty. Because <laughs> if you share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a rabbit, a a rat, a horse, a bird, I don't care what. You know perfectly well, we are not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. And so because the chimps are so like us biologically as well, so we share 98.6% of our DNA with them. And so that, along with the detailed descriptions that I was making, and then when the geographic sent filmmaker Hugo van Lawick, who became my husband, and his footage began circulating, the scientists had to believe that what I said was true. And my supervisor came out to, to Gombe for two weeks. He'd been my sternest critic, but afterwards he said, I've learned more in these two weeks about animal behavior than all the rest of my life together. So he's the one who helped me put my rather revolutionary way of thinking of things uh, into to think scientifically so that I could express it without, you know, without letting myself in for a lot of criticism from my uh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, the students um, from the Lincoln Park Zoo and the Brookfield Zoo had, had a couple of questions that I wanna make sure we address some of those. And one of them was, and I think this is a, a, an interesting um, question that they posed was um, for you, Jane, was um, they wanted to know where you see the future of animal behavior research going. And if you see that, if there's an opportunity for technology to play a role. 
Well, I see that the, the behavior, the um, understanding of animal behavior and intelligence has never been as high as it is now. And, you know, we know that highly intelligent beings exist on this planet. It's not just us, not just the apes and the monkeys, the elephants, the lions, but it goes as far down as the octopus. If you've seen that amazing mm -hmm. film, My Octopus Teacher, but there's a lot written about the intelligence of the octopus and people are studying animal emotion and people are studying um, animal personality. So for young people wanting to go into this sort of career, the opportunities have never been greater in my lifetime. It's really exciting. And does technology play a role? Absolutely. So in some areas, we use camera traps uh, because the, the environment, the forest is being destroyed, well, almost everywhere. We train um, volunteers from the 104 villages where we work with these communities. We've trained them at a workshop to use smartphones, iPads or iTablets, whatever it is. And they measure the health of their forest reserves, which is great because that's where nearly all the chimps live, not protected. But now because of that program that you mentioned, this community-based um, conservation, They've become our partners in conservation because they understand protecting the environment isn't just to protect it for animals and wildlife, it's their own future that's at stake. And so there's many, I mean, we use drones, we use DNA analysis to work out the relationship between the different chimps. We use a lot of technology, GIS, GPS, satellite imagery, on and on and on. Yeah, lots of opportunity. For sure. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by asking Creed this, but I'll ask Jane this too. Um, I did want to ask about um, what you thought, um, you know, you know, it's easy to be overwhelmed by um, climate change and conservation and, and the concerns that we all have. Do you, and especially the students asked about this. Um, they asked about what you thought were some everyday solutions. Um, that we can make to have an impact um, in, in our lifestyles and in the work that we do, um, especially as students. Um, can you talk a little bit, Kree, about what you think, um, you, the advice you would give to, to young people and students especially about the impact that they can have? You know, that's a good question because um, it's going to vary per person. I mean, some simple changes would be if you're not in a room, turn off the light <laughs> versus, and this, well, this is for anyone, not just for students. If you're not in a room that you're not using, turn off the light to conserve energy. If you're a driver, um, try to skip going through the drive through park your car and go inside so that the emission from the car doesn't go into the atmosphere. Um, do your best to, re to practice reduce, reuse, and recycle different products. You know, try not to buy a lot of things that could eventually end up in the landfill or, yeah, could end up in the landfill or in the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, therefore have an effect on a different type of aquatic life or land life that exists. Um, those are some of the simple things that can be done. And, and I guess another thing, too, is just as a student or as an individual, try to educate yourself on different types of um, harm that your purchasing habits can do on the environment. And so that will not just the harm, but yeah, yeah, the harm on what you're what you can do on the, on the environment. So therefore that will make you make different help you to make different decisions when you're buying things, when you're using things. Okay. And Jane, can you talk a little bit about the advice you would give to young people about what they can do to have an impact on climate change? Yeah, well, um, climate change is daunting. There's no question about it. You know, the changing weather patterns, the worst floods and droughts and storms, the terrible wildfires, I mean, all of that is daunting. And many people actually look around the globe. We always hear, think globally, act locally. But if you look around the globe, you're depressed. What can I do? But if you do, whatever you can locally, 
you see that you or you and your friends are making a difference. So twist that around, act locally and then dare to think globally. So, you know, I was smiling when Cree said about turning the lights off when you leave a room. When I was lecturing, I used to travel 300 days a year and I'd go into conference room after conference room with the blinds drawn down and the lights on. And there was, you know, there was no video or anything, just people around the table. So I'd go in and, and immediately pull up the blinds and turn the light off. And somebody, the next person would come in and say, oh dear, and put the light on again. I <laughs> try to teach people that it was very important and that while one single action may seem to make no difference, and it wouldn't if it was just, I mean, if it was just me and Cree turning lights off, mm -hmm. the world wouldn't change. But there are now millions of people who've got the message from Cree and people like this. Uh, so that is beginning to make a difference. And one thing I would tell young people is try to move towards a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And that's not just because of the terrible cruelty to animals, and it was eating wildlife that gets trafficked around the world that leads to these zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. Uh, but in addition, the factory farms, A, they're terribly cruel, B, there's billions of animals crowded into these horrible spaces. They have to be fed. Huge areas of environment are destroyed to grow the grain to feed them. Masses of fossil fuel to work all the heavy machinery, get the grain to the animals, and then the animals to the abattoir, and then the meat to the table. Water, increasingly scarce in some parts of the world due to the long droughts. Lots of water is needed to change vegetable to animal protein. And finally, they all produce methane gas which along with carbon dioxide is one of the two most important greenhouse gases. You know, they make it in their, in their digestion. We do too, but the billions of animals. So moving towards a plant-based diet is very important. Mm -hmm. It's also good for our health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's been proven. Um, yeah, I, um, I, you know, in, in speaking to a lot of um, my colleagues in in green building that are that are working towards um, greening the built environment and reducing resources, I've I've noticed a theme too of of how much they've started as conservationists um, by first being having an empathy uh, and a concern for conservation of animals, um, and that that. Uh, that is something that uh, that seems to come up over and over again with colleagues. But I, I was kind of curious to hear what you think about um, as far as the journey to value conservation um, and start the and start that connection to nature. Um, does does that often start with an empathy for animals? I think uh, there are various ways in which it starts yeah. for me. You know, I was so happy at Gombe. I got my PhD. I had a little research station. That was the, my life. And then I went to a conference. We brought together the people studying chimps in different places. It was mainly to discuss behavior change in different environments. But we had a session on conservation. And it was absolutely shocking because right across Africa, wherever the chimps were being studied, forests were disappearing and chimpanzee numbers were plummeting. And so I went to the conference as a scientist and I left as an activist. And, you know, this, this led to conservation. Of course, I have empathy for animals. That's why I became a vegetarian. Now I'm more or less a vegan. And, you know, I grew up with animals. It was my beloved Rusty. I used to spend hours riding horses, but, um, so the, the empathy is, has always been there since I was a tiny little girl. But it's no good having empathy for animals and worrying about uh, their future if we don't pay attention to the environment and conservation. Because if we go on losing forests and polluting the ocean and, and you know, 
harming the grasslands, the peatlands, everything, then there's nowhere for the animals to be. And for that matter, nowhere for us to be either. So we're, we're slowly eating away our future and the future of young people. We're stealing their future by this crazy idea that you can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources, which in some places are being used up faster than nature can replenish them. And moreover, a planet where human and livestock populations are growing. We've got to find another way of doing things. And many people are hoping that this pandemic has woken people up, sort of wake up call. We need a new relationship with the natural world because you know it was our disrespect of the natural world that led to the pandemic. Yeah. Kriya, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you a variation on that question as well. I mean, you working with, with um, young people and connecting them and engaging them in nature, um, are you seeing that um, that connection um, to nature is leading to a real passion for conservation and seeing an empathy for animals to do that? Yeah, most, um, yeah, for sure, most definitely. Um, through my time, especially, and I'll just speak um, about the youth that I've worked with so far mm -hmm. with the Forest Reserve of Cook County. A lot of the young people, as I mentioned, come into the program, uh, not really having any connection to the outdoors and to nature at all. And I'll just speak to one of them specifically. I've always been impressed with her path. Like she came into the program uh, as someone who had long fingernails. She was into cosmetology. She was all about doing hair. And this is three, four years ago. Now to this, this point in her life, never had any connection to the outdoors and nature. She's, um, she knows how to do brush pile burns. To, she, she knows how to do invasive plant removal. She, she's certified to do all those things. She knows how to operate a chainsaw. She has led workshops <laughs> Uh, on, on how youth need to be more environmentally minded. Like she is the perfect example of someone who in, in, in my language went from zero to 10. Like she can now labor herself as, as an advocate for the environment. And I've really been impressed with her. And she's not the only young person that I've worked with, you know, that have made that transition. That is at the point now where they wanna make a difference um, in the world and, 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 and to be mentors to other young people. Um, yeah, I kind of forgot the question because I went on that. <laughs> no, that's great. No, that, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. But, yeah, I think that. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. But they, no, but there, but there are a lot of young people that that I've seen that have gone through that transformation, and and want to have an impact in this world. Yep, and I agree with you, Cree. I've I've seen it again and again and again. And my favorite story was a boy of about. Uh, 11 when I first met him. And this was right at the beginning of Roots and Jutes. And I wanted to see if it would work in the inner city. So we found a school in the Bronx and it was mostly black students with a few Latino. And they were from very, very deprived families. Their older brothers and sisters and often their fathers and mothers were in gangs and they mostly wore hoods. Well. I was asked to give a talk there. So I talked about the chimps. I thought that might interest them. I showed pictures. And I don't know, there were people walking up and down the gangways all the time, teachers. I was told afterwards they were looking for knives. I'm afraid it would be guns today, mm -hmm. but anyway. Um, and I thought, well, I don't know if it made any difference. A year later, they asked me to go back. And the, the head teacher and the woman who'd started Roots and Shoots, they had tears in their eyes. They said, the children are going to make a presentation to you. And I know that you've seen more sophisticated presentation, but these children have never presented before. Mm. And the one that stands out in my mind was this young man, Trevor. And when I first went, I didn't even see him. He, was a, he always sat at the back of the class. He always had the hood over his face and he played truant most of the time. A year later, he's one of the presenters, there's a group of two. He said, I decided 
I would do something for animals. And he's standing up very straight, no hood, nothing like that. And he said, um, I found a, a Kellogg's cereal package with a picture drawn of a chimpanzee dressed up in clothes and smiling. And he said, I remember you saying that when a chimpanzee makes this, this face, he's not smiling, he's fearful. And I wrote to you and you said, yes, Travis, you're right. That's when I decided to take action. So he and this other kid wrote a letter to Kellogg's. Well, actually there was a big campaign going on, but he didn't know about that. And he got a letter from Kellogg's saying, thank you, Mr. Travis, whatever his name was. Um, and, the, and the picture was withdrawn. So just imagine the change in that young man's life and, and you know, the empowerment from that. It was extraordinary. One of the most amazing stories ever. Yeah, definitely. That opportunity to empower um, young people to, to, you know, to connect to something and connect to, to uh, that opportunity and, and drive, have that passion drive them to, to something else is, is always very exciting when you get a chance to do that. Um, for sure, I agree. Um, so, um, the, also, also, the students asked too about um, about uh, you know this past year we've all around the world have been dealing with um, COVID nineteen shutdowns and and being isolated and being at home. Uh, can you? I, I'll ask you both, but um, I'll start with uh, Jane uh, about um, this last year. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, this opportunity to pause and adapt and what changes you've made in the last year to your lifestyle. And if any of these changes are, are changes that are, that will stay. Well, first of all, I had no opportunity to pause. At first when I was, um, I was, I call it grounded here. <laughs> Luckily I was in England at the time. And you know, this is the home where I grew up, which I share with my sister and her family. So, I was frustrated and angry that my tour was suddenly chopped like that. People were angry and disappointed. But then I thought there's no good being frustrated and angry. And so a little team from JGI helped to create Virtual Jane. Virtual Jane has never, ever been as busy in my whole life. And it is relentless. There are no weekends. There's, there wasn't even a whole Christmas day or birthday, there were events coming up, there's Zooms and Skypes and virtual lectures and virtual joining panels and doing a hope cast, a podcast that we call the hope cast. And it just doesn't stop day after day. Sometimes the last one is 10 o'clock at night because of where, where the other people are in the world. Sometimes it's eight o'clock in the morning and you know, so I've just been very, very, very busy. But the silver lining, I've reached millions more people with a message in many more countries and worked out how to do this thing because giving a lecture is the hardest. When I give a lecture, I like to feel the feedback from the audience. You know, they laugh, they clap, they cry, whatever. But now I'm doing a lecture to this little green speck on the top of my laptop and to get the same enthusiasm and feeling and emotion into that is, has been a challenge, but I knew I had to do it or there was no point doing it at all. Can you talk about the, this last year and the changes yeah. you've seen? I mean, I, I, I totally agree with the challenges with being doing anything on Zoom, whether it's a presentation or communicating with people, um, it for me, uh, I, I'm d definitely going to zap, adapt um, some virtual, do more virtual things, you know, with my life because I, I've gotten accustomed to it. Uh, but I do know that the part that I I miss a lot is connecting in real time with people, being in front of people face to face. Um, but moving forward, uh, I'm definitely going to do do more virtual things because it does eliminate me driving back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, which which doesn't help the environment out that much. Um, 
And um, I am very appreciative of, of family and friends a little bit more, you know, because of COVID. Uh, I, I, I value people's friendship even more now than I've done in the past. Um, so those are some of the major changes that I'm probably going to make. Uh, keep doing virtual work. Um, try my best to connect with people that I haven't talked to in a while, and mm -hmm. and find ways to find ways to do face to face with some folks. Um, but more importantly, um, for me moving forward, is I want to play a stronger role in young people's lives, especially those that I work with. Um, because I, I'm more appreciative of of the work that I can do and, and the people that I can talk to and reach. Very similar to what Jane said. So I really felt what your message, Jane. Were, were you able to uh, still have some, did a lot of programming um, go the on summer? pause the last year? We, um, our programming, no, no, no. Our, you know what, our youth program did, we did transition the majority of it to virtual. And I was really impressed with, you know, the, uh, the, the people on my team that we were able to come up with ways of connecting young people to nature through a computer. Um, so we did send them out in their neighborhoods or in their own backyard doing different types of plant identification, looking for different types of birds, um, camouflaging themselves in the environment the same way that an animal or an insect would. So we did come up with different ways to, to connect them to nature <laughs> through a computer. And so we were really proud of ourselves because we were like, oh no, how are we gonna do this? <laughs> but we yeah, made it was it much the same with roots and shoots, you know, the same sort of thing, working on getting the kids the experience they needed with nature. Through a computer. Much easier for some than others. I mean, some of them, you know, the wealthier ones who live in nice open neighborhoods, they, and I can walk here because we're right by the ocean. And so it's, I think we've had just about the lowest rate of infection of anywhere here. Um, so I could walk the dog every day and, you know, that sort of thing. But for some kids in a small apartment building with possibly abusive parents, then must have been very, very, well, it was very, very difficult. And they became depressed, a lot of depression. And you must have met this too, Cree you know, suicide rates went up with, with young people. So doing one's best to try and lift them out of this depression by telling them, you matter, you make a difference. You can make a difference even where you are now. Yeah, I just want to mention, speaking of additional challenges, and we're talking about technology too, technology was a huge challenge. Some young people, they didn't have computers, if they had a cell phone, they didn't have a great reception with the cell phone. And so, yeah, and, and if you're doing video presentations, well, their reception is so horrible, the only thing they can do is listen to people's voice. So that puts them at a disadvantage if they can't see different types of images if you're trying to connect them to the outside. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you. Um, we only have a few minutes, but Jane, I, I did. Uh, you did mention your hope cast. Um, I did want to want to give you the opportunity to talk about that hope cast and um, to talk about um, what gives you hope, um, especially in this last year and the transition that we've you know been going through and and the work that you've been doing over the last year and, and into the future. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what well, inspires hope? Let me click on some of that to answer. <laughs> First of all, the Hopecast is simply a podcast. We call it a, a Hopecast because everything I do is about hope. The books I write about hope. There's a new book coming out in, in the early October called The Book of Hope. And so, uh, um, oh dear, my mind's jumped away. So it's talking to people in different spheres of life, all sorts of different ones. And, you know, just having a chat, really. It's gone down terribly well. It shot up to be um, among one of the top 10% to be watched around the world. So does that, but that's just a small piece of what I do. 
And you asked so many questions. What was the what sorry, was, sorry? I wanted to make sure you get a chance. On, to, I'm to thinking. To, <laughs> sorry, I was trying to cram that in, but I um because you you do um look looking to the future. Um, just want to ask you about what what brought hope um to you oh, and, and inspired you. Well, first of all, it's the young people. I mean, they are mm -hmm. making a difference, and once you listen to them, once they are empowered to take action, boy. It's incredibly hopeful. And secondly, the you know, biggest difference between us and chimps is explosive development of our intellect. I mean, we've sent a rocket to Mars and a little robot crawls around up there taking photos. And so it's bizarre that this most intellectual creature is destroying its only home. And there seems to be a disconnect between the brain and the heart. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder who chose the heart to poetically seek love and compassion anyway. And um, so fortunately, the brain is beginning to work with the heart and scientists are coming up with innovative ways that we can live in greater harmony with nature, you know, all the solar wind and stuff. If governments would just subsidize clean green energy instead of going on with this cozy relationship with oil and gas. Um, next comes the resilience of nature the places we've totally destroyed, give them a chance and maybe a bit of help. And once again, nature can return. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And finally, there's what I call the indomitable human spirit. The people who tackle what seems to be impossible and they won't give up and either they succeed or they inspire others to take up the cause. And when you meet people like this, you know, there's icons like Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King, but then there's the people tackling tremendous physical disabilities who mm -hmm. you, know, you would expect to stay at home, but no, they're out there inspiring others. And so all of this, you have to be hopeful. But, you know, there, it, we are damaging the world to the point when there will be a point of no return. That's for sure. But we've still got this window of time. We must act now. Yeah, thank you. So um, with that, thank you both for, for taking the time to have this conversation with us and, and inspire us with, with hope uh, for the future and especially with, um, with so many young people listening and, and being a part of this uh, conversation. So I wanna, I wanna take this time to thank you both for, for taking the time to speak with me and, and being very candid with your answers. So with that, I'm going to toss it off to Sandy. Well, thank you, Juanita. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for moderating <laughs> us. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you so much for stargazing with us today. Um, you know, this speaker, this series is about connecting diverse activists to the next generation of change makers. And boy, I think for our debut, this was fantastic. That's exactly what you did. And I think my big takeaway is just how much we are all connected, how we're all connected to each other, to the planet, to the animals, and to our purpose. Um, so thank you each. Uh, Dr. Jane, Cree, Juanita, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I want to also thank all the kids and the grown-ups and everybody in between, all the attendees here today who are cultivating tomorrows. And I really heard you, Jane, when you said that young people are the hope. That's it. You are the hope. And we cannot wait to see what you will do with this world that we are all connected to. Um, so thank you. Thank you for uh, our partners, for the Jane Goodall Institute, for the Forest Preserves of Cook County, for the Lincoln Park Zoo and the Brookfield Zoo. Um, the next speaker in our series is going to be Dr. Mona, who worked on the Flint water crisis. And that'll be August 16th. Please join us for that. Um, and, uh, you know, just like Roots and Shoots says, Make the world better for people and animals and the environment and that each one of us has a role to play. 
thank you all so much for joining us and a special thanks to Jan Ann Dubin and Mary Ellen Woods for bringing this whole thing together and believing that this was possible. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Thank you.